Hello, good afternoon. Today, I'm a little behind schedule, but, you know, is there really a schedule for this? So we're on stage 14 of the tour. No, we're not. We're on stage 15. Uh, where does the time go? So it's another mild hilly stage, another stage with a intermediate sprint. Unfortunately for Sagan, two riders got away. You try as he might, he's been working really hard to be in the break so he could lead the sprint across and gain maximum points. Had he done that, he would have broken his own record, which is the record for most points acquired in the sprinting jersey competition, the Mali Vert, the green jersey. Instead, it'll you know be another day, maybe even at the end of the stage, because he's in the lead group. And again today, the peloton has decided, meh, who cares? Let him race. We don't really want to bother. So even at this point, the peloton is 11 minutes behind, and we still have another 60 kilometers to race. And behind Sagan right here, the one he is making sure is not going to attack him, is Greg Van Avermont, who did wear the yellow jersey for like nine days, the first part of the tour. Seems like a whole other race. Probably does to Greg Van Avermont as well. And Van Avermont is the reigning Olympic road racing champion. So he has these, and I'll paint when I get there, but these gold bands on his sleeves. Racers who have been a champion of some sort, um, national champion, world champion, whatever, will wear those colors <clears throat> on their sleeves. And then the rest of the kit is normal. Now, for the current, they usually have a very different jersey. Um, so you've seen, if you look at all the paintings, you've seen the um, Belgian national jersey, the Luxembourg, the Spanish, various different jerseys. And of course, Sagan, if he weren't in green, would be wearing the World Championship jersey with the rainbow stripes. stripes. The rainbow stripes, like the Olympic flag, represent at least one color from every flag in the nation. I mean, of all nations in the world. So unlike yesterday, in the painting I painted yesterday, it doesn't appear that anyone is going to come out and sprint against Sagan like the young French rider did yesterday. It looks like instead they're like, yeah, go for it, have at it. So it seems to be a <laughs> bit of a truce today all the way around from the peloton and from the breakaway group. One of the things I like to do, because it helps create the perspective and it's just a nice line to break up all the color <clears throat> of the roadway is, I mean, it's not that it isn't there, but to put in the crosswalks, they help establish a look of um, perspective like the wall does on the other side there. And you notice also that the painting isn't lined up right smack in the middle that the riders are a little bit to the left. Um, compositionally that's strong. Also in this case Sagan has moved all the way over to the barrier so that he only has to look over one shoulder to make sure nobody's attacking him. So it's both a race, oh, my brush wasn't clean again, It's both a race technique to force it to one side and then also 
a um, compositional technique to make the painting a little more interesting. There's all sorts of different <clears throat> kinds of rules for how to build a painting. One thing about art making is learn all the rules and then figure out how to break them. And I think I've talked earlier about, I did have an instructor who once told me the first four lines of your painting are the edges of the canvas or edges you know, of the paper, whatever your substrate is. So I've never worked all the way to the edges of the paper since because, you know, that was a rule. I'll break that rule. His point was, again, to try to think about your composition within the page. Don't do something in the middle of the page without thinking about it. So, I sort of completely understood the point and agree with the point, but that doesn't mean I have to follow it. But, in all things in art is you want to make your alterations out of knowledge, not out of ignorance. So you want to know what the rules of perspective are before you break them, what the actual figure is. And I've spent a lot of time studying the figure, learning true anatomy, drawing from the model, drawing the skeleton, all of those kinds of things. So you really know, again, that you come from a place of uh, knowledge and not of ignorance. Again, I will avoid political remarks. And um, so, now we're moving on through, again, like I have always done, we work with the um, paler shades, they rather will first pale and then also warm and then move into cool. Um, if you're going to have colors bleed into each other, <clears throat> you want the warm colors down first, they're going to be less, um, they will be rather more affected by the cool colors bleeding into them. So you would like to avoid getting that muddy, polluted color. Um, I once had a gentleman try to explain to me, and he was somebody who should know better, that the best way to make your colors bright is to mix some of the complement into them, which is exactly wrong. Actually, and he may have just been misspeaking himself, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, that um, really what you want to do is if like these reds are, or the greens are brighter because the reds are near them, the complementary colors help make the painting each color bounce. Your eye has a natural um, desire to see a balance to see the complements. Um, you may have over time seen the um, there's an image of the American flag that's green and black stripes with an orange field and if you stare at that and then stare at the um, a white piece of paper magically I think it's kind of magical magically the um, correct colors of the flag will appear. It's because your eye in the after image is trying to balance itself. It's trying to see the um, it, the after image is, is your eye balancing itself out and so it sees the other colors. It's the sort of negative, if you will, of what you were just looking at. So I'm going to build myself a brown here using some sienna and some of the darks and the darks again that I make are used, um, are created from a dark green, a hooker's green and an alizarin crimson so that I can get these uh, brown shorts and shoulders of AG2R 
I've always liked their kit, although they've changed it a bit this year. It's not as not as enamored of the kit as I was before, but still, they're the one color, the one team with a different color than everybody else. <clears throat> Now we're going to lay in again that black that I built. I think I've talked before about a lot of teams, most teams in fact, wear black cycling shorts and most cyclists wear black cycling shorts. And there was a time when virtually every team was wearing black kit. And maybe that's stopping now because you'll see images of <clears throat> the riders with um, dark black or with the black kit and the salt stains from you know sweating as they ride along and to me it seems like boy if you're wearing black on a hot summer day you're going to be just that much hotter now, there's a lot of technology that goes into keeping those kits as cool as possible, but still. It seems to me if you're wearing white or a pale light color, you're going to be a lot more comfortable. Team Sky certainly has figured that out. They were one of the ones that sort of started the black trend, and now their jerseys are white. All right, so now we just need to lay in the sky. I mean, the sky. Hmm, there's no sky in this image. <clears throat> lay in the roadway so getting a taking that same black again the fabricated black that I use mixing some ultramarine blue into it a little bit of phthalo as well and a fair amount of water so like that stroke is just a little too heavy so you notice I just picked up water and then again you want to always be conscious of how you put your brush stroke in help it create movement, help it create the form. So I'm following the perspective of the road as I lay this in, in the center of the painting, because it's one point perspective. That will be, huh, I see something I forgot to do that I normally do before I start watercoloring. I forgot to title and sign. We can do that after. I may just do that after I finish the video, just for time's sake. But I think I'll call it double checking. So this painting will be available for purchase. Probably not until um, Monday, just because I've you know got to work for a living too. So you can come back and check for it then at theartofcycling.blogspot.com, and I'll write that link in the uh, description. And then, um, or you can go directly to my website, which is gregleach.com, unusual spelling to Greg, G-R-E-I-G-L-E-A-C-H. And then I do hope you will consider subscribing so that you can see every painting. I am painting every stage of the tour and sharing one of these videos each day. All right, so when you see this in the blog, you'll see that it's signed and titled, which just happens right down here on the bottom. Thank you so much for taking the time to look today. See you tomorrow. Actually, tomorrow's a rest day, so see you on Tuesday.